I'm Roger Baker, Executive Director of the Stratfor Center for Applied Geopolitics at RAIN, a global center of excellence for geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Learn how you can put geopolitics to work for your organization at RAINNetwork.com. Hello and welcome to a special edition episode of RAIN Insights. In preparation for RAIN and NASDAQ's upcoming summit on September 9th, RAIN founder and chief collaborative officer David Lawrence is sitting down with a number of industry leaders to discuss major compliance, security, and geopolitical issues that are top of mind for global organizations. In this episode, David chats with Jim Nadler and Van Hesser. Jim Nadler is the current president and CEO of KBRA. Prior to joining KBRA, Jim was responsible for alternative assets in the New England Asset Management Division at General Re Corporation. Over the last 30 years, Jim has held several executive roles in the financial analysis arena, including at mainstays in the ratings industry, as well as independent research firms. Jim is also the board chairman of Deal Vector, serves on the board for the New York City, Long Island chapter of Breakthrough, T1D, and is an elected member of the Economic Club in New York City. Van Hesser is the Senior Managing Director and Chief Strategist at KBRA, where he is responsible for commenting on market and economic developments and their impact on credit markets. He is also a member of the firm's Executive Committee. Van is the creator and host of KBRA's weekly podcast, Three Things in Credit. Previously, he led the company's financial institutions and corporates credit rating groups, where he leveraged over 30 years of experience as an institutional investor, sell-side research analyst, investment banker, and regulator. We hope you enjoy. Van and Jim, uh, thank you for truly a great honor. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. Uh, maybe a good way to start is uh, just to talk a little bit about uh, KBRA, a little bit of the history. Jim, uh, you've been there since day one, and uh, Jules Kroll was involved in the early days. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough, I mentioned to Van, uh, to visit your offices and when you were just a startup. And I love the idea, obviously socialized it a great deal with Goldman Sachs. But uh, why don't we begin with a bit of an overview about KBRA and its uh, position in the market? Sure. Um, yeah, and it was it was great. You were one of our early meetings that we had, and and uh, one of the few uh, that didn't slam the door in our face uh, in those early days. So uh, it was a, it was a, a, me- a memorable meeting. Um, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I, it, Jules didn't have a background in ratings, but he had over the years been a user of ratings, and I think the great financial crisis really shook his uh, trust in ratings. And he really had this notion, he built his reputation on integrity and trust. And he had this notion that we somehow had to bring integrity and trust back to the rating business. And so when we met, uh, I, I was, re- you know, having, having worked in uh, the rating industry, I was really intrigued by this notion. And uh, so I decided to, uh, to work with him on founding the company. And I think that the the most important thing we did was in those early days, 2010 and and beyond, really start to bring back trust in the rating uh, business. We spent a lot of time with investors. But the other thing that we did that I think is counterintuitive, but, but very interesting and very important for the capital market, after the great financial crisis, people were nervous about the the uh, fixed income markets and and along with investors the rating agencies became very gun shy and so we really were uh, really took the rating industry back to its early days you know ratings were developed for two reasons one first and foremost is to protect investors we exist to protect investors. But the second reason we exist is to facilitate healthy capital formation. And, you know, it's a little bit like why you put brakes on cars. You don't put brakes on cars to go slower. You put brakes on cars so you can go faster. 
And one of the reasons that rating agencies exist is to facilitate this healthy commerce and healthy capital formation. And after the great financial crisis, the even leading up to the great financial crisis, the incumbent rating agencies had just become very rule bound and set in their ways. And it was really they were really weren't um, fulfilling this sort of second tier, second uh, pillar of, of what rating agencies are, are uh, supposed to be doing in the capital market. And we really brought that back as well. So it was not only a commitment to listen to investors and to, to do a better job of protecting investors, but it was a commitment to the, the capital markets in general to help bring back this sort of healthy facilitation of capital and listen to new ideas and to really work with the the uh, the issuers and investors to make sure that we were uh, the connective tissue in that process. And I think that that we've done that as well. Um, and and you know, in thinking about where we've succeeded, it's really areas where the incumbent rating agencies, just weren't interested in helping develop those markets. And so we really capitalized on those markets. And today we're the fourth largest rating agency because of that sort of void in the market. So I love the metaphor about the card. I'd actually like to expand upon it. Uh, not so much so you can drive fast, so you can drive it all, Jim, okay? It's true. Yeah, and uh, it's not just for investors. It, look, I. I was an early believer in the business that you were building, uh, in large part because I, I saw that you had an appreciation for what was needed on both sides of the trade, the issuers as well as the investors, and that when it works properly, it's a win-win. Issuers can raise the capital they need to build right. businesses. Investors get a return and safety on their investment. And just, I, I'm not saying anyone needs a refresher course in terms of the financial crisis, but you know, a little bit of a speed date is that among the things that, uh, and there have been reports about that, that was a important factor in the crisis itself was that various paper was being rated as safe and AAA when in fact it wasn't. Right. And there had been a diminution of standards in understanding what was coming to the market. People were buying it on blind faith. You know, it worked for a while as all these things do, but then, you know, at some point uh, it stopped and, and, you know, issues about conflicts of interest and lack of understanding about the under, underlying assets, a lack of appreciation for the risk, uh, a lack of accuracy all played a major factor in the financial crisis. And just to put uh, a little bit of a exclamation point on your comments, uh, I'm reminded about Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, had a remark about the United States that I've always tried to keep in mind. It's like a pendulum. It swings to the left and then it swings to the right. Hopefully it settles. But you recited uh, something which is when everything did blow up, the rating agencies that were in the market became gunshot. There were legitimate companies and legitimate assets that needed to be rated, but the pendulum was now in the other extreme right. because of everything that had happened. And so I'll, I'll call it, you know, in many respects, I saw KBRA and the launch of it being not only necessary, not only addressing an issue, but quite frankly, filling an important void in the marketplace. It, we did. And maybe, Van, this would be a good place for you to uh, chime in because you really led this effort. Maybe talk about the regional banks and the the journey that we went on with investors and issuers uh, of, of regional banks where they cert they couldn't get a hearing at the incumbent rating agencies. They just wouldn't rate them investment grade, even the ones that fulfilled all of the investment grade requirements. So, Van, I'll turn it over to you to talk well, that'd a little bit. It would be great to give us basically the, the, the journey in terms of where you are now. Yeah. For sure. So I think, you know, I think we all agree that, uh, you know, the ratings business can be a very human business. And having gone through what the legacy agencies did, 
which contributed directly, in my opinion, right, our opinion, to uh, the GFC. You can understand that conservatism coming out of it. Now, I think we've you've heard from us that um, you know serving investors, serving issuers, serving the capital markets. After all, we're kind of gatekeepers to the capital markets. If we're doing that job well, um, you know, we're going to learn from episodes in the past, and we're going to think about how things have changed as we think about the risks in any particular sector going forward. So. You know, one of the things that, that we reflected back at the time on was that post a crisis, and this has happened not just in the GFC, but every time we've had a wave of bank crises going back 100 years, after each crisis, there's learning, right? Learning on the part of managers, learning on the part of board members, learning on the part of policymakers, of regulators, of investors, right? So even though having gone through you know, one of these cataclysmic events, it's a hard human thing to do is to go in and and still go out and assess the risks now, especially that material improvements have been made. And so one of the things that, um, you know, we did, we started with going back in and researching, you know, bank failures over 100 years. And we discovered something that was interesting and not all that intuitive in that, yes, very small banks um, tend to have a higher default rate. But so did the largest banks, right? And in the middle, to Jim's point, were a whole range of community and regional banks that had a very um, uh, dependable business model. And again, you'd say, well, well, that might not make sense. How can a how can a small bank compete with with some of the largest banks? And then you realize, when you sort of go in and peel that onion a bit, you think about cost structure, right? It's it's understanding that deposit insurance equalizes funding costs, whether you're Bank of America or whether you're you know, a well-run community bank. Cost structure, right? We all know that, um, well, again, you, you'd think that banking would be a big economies of scale business, and in some respects it is, but it's really local scale, which gets you over that hump. And what that means, interestingly, is that as institutions get bigger and bigger and more global, 100 business lines in 100 countries, it's maybe not all that intuitive, but the risk that goes with that, the span of control risk, introduces very real considerations among the largest banks. Whereas we would make the case that community and regional banks, when they stick to their knitting and when they take advantage of their local market knowledge, when you couple that with that cost structure, which again, counterintuitively, um, is very competitive, you can make a case that that the whole swath of the banking system really was investment grade. And to Jim's point, I think our legacy rating agencies took one look at that small size. They've got a, a, a really unsubstantiated bias that says this small in banking just isn't going to work. It's going to lead to adverse selection. You're not going to be competitive. Again, we tested all that and came out with a very different view. That then became the basis for what became the KBRA market for bank subordinated debt. So we opened that market up for investors, and we've seen you know tremendous investor acceptance because you know the research was done, the work was done behind that. And so today we are the absolute leader uh, in community and regional banks. People look to us for how to evaluate the risks and rewards um, in these institutions. And just to make one other point, it really wasn't, it, it, it wasn't our, our groundbreaking work wasn't limited to community and regional banks in the financial institution space, but you can think about specialty finance, which is you know, positive evolutionary steps we think in the financial system. A lot of that took has continues to take place in what we think is the world's best financial system. But our legacy rating agencies just took one look at that and thought back to the contributing role that mortgage banks or broker dealers or you know had in the GFC. And they said, we're not going to look at it. That's exactly when you know the markets need KBRA. And, and David, it's really the most interesting part of the whole thing or the most satisfying part to me is um, we now have a leadership position across that landscape. But guess who else is in rating all of those 
small banks and all of the incumbent rating agencies. So we rate about 160 uh, community and regional banks. Moody's rates about 30. Uh, they're they're trying to compete with us, and they you know they just can't because of our research. Um, and so it's really I think it speaks to the important role that we play in the have played in the market. And I think it also speaks to why we've grown so quickly uh, in in this in these past fifteen years because the the market really needed what KBRA was offering to um, uh, to bridge the gap between where the non-rated market was and where the incumbent rating agencies were, um, and to and somebody who was willing to do the research to hire, you know, sort of top-notch talent and really spend time with investors. Um, you know, I don't have to tell you, David, you know what it's like to get a hold of an analyst at one of the incumbent rating agencies. Um, we spend literally, uh, we so just this last quarter, we've had over a thousand touch points with investors, whether it was a dinner, a meeting, a Zoom meeting, or we went out to their shop and visited them, or they came in and visited us. A thousand in a quarter. Um, that's you know the the other rating agencies, even the large ones, can't can't boast that claim. I was going to say it's not just the uh, quantity of the meetings, Jim and Van. It's it's the qualitative relationship with with the analysts that that does matter. Okay, Have that you? is that is so yeah. true. Yeah. So uh, talk to us a little bit about where your business is going. And I was remarking uh, that, you know, part of the logo that Van has in the background is uh, the word trusted. And that is such a key element um, in what you do, because ultimately it is about the confidence that not only investors have in terms of your work, but that the confidence that issuers have, that you're an honest broker uh, in this, and that when you come to certain conclusions, there is transparency and an understanding about the basis of those conclusions. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about the rating process itself, how you get under the covers with companies, and also where you're taking the business now. This is really great questions, David. And I, I think that the, the your your point about transparency is really important. We have, uh, as as I mentioned, we spend an enormous amount of time with investors. We think that's the most important thing that we do. It, when we come to work every day, understanding in the the world through investors' eyes is the most important thing we do. Therefore, spending time with them and making sure that we understand where their concerns are and what opportunities they see. And that's led us to be able to be leaders in many of the new markets, particularly around private credit. We were an early uh, developer of the private credit market. We were, were the first one to rate some of the platforms. We were the first company to rate some of the smaller um, uh, asset managers. We are the first one to rate uh, on a fairly large scale, the fund ratings, the different fund ratings, whether it's a NAV fund or, or uh, the different types of fund rating. And we continue to be the leader in that market. And as, as with the bank market, now all of the incumbent rating agencies, which, you know, Two years ago, we're writing every negative, every piece that came out from a from Moody's S and P or Fitch on the private credit market was negative. Today, they're all three trying to get into the private credit market because now they see, oh, there's an opportunity. Fitch is really making uh, KBRA is really making hay in it, and we need to be in it. And so, I think that your your point about the trust that investors have placed in us allows us to take these leadership. Uh, roles in some of the really private credit is probably the largest change to happen to the fixed income market in the last 50 years. And the fact that KBRA was the leader from a rating standpoint in that market speaks to the trust that we built with investors and the void that was left in the market by the three rating agencies whose knee jerk reaction was 
this has got to be bad. Therefore, you know, we're, we, we're going to, we're going to, uh, write negative pieces about it. And, and now it's, it's just, I think it's very funny to watch them all sort of flailing around trying to, you know, come up with, well, why they've changed their mind and here, Oh, we, we like this certain aspect of it. And we're, you know, we're trying to, to work with it, but it, it gets back to that trust. And, and, and I think that's the reason that we're now, you know, we're a full service rating agency. We're in every sector. We rate municipals. We rate some of the largest municipals. Uh, we're in corporates. We rate uh, some of the largest insurance companies. We rate Lloyd's of London. Uh, we rate uh, some of the the uh, most important mid-sized banks. Uh, we rate almost every uh, every uh, asset manager, and then we're a big player in structured finance. Whether it is uh, whether it's commercial mortgage-backed security, residential, or asset-backed. And what's really interesting is now that we're, you know, we've become an established player in many of these fields, it's rewarding to me to have a banker come back and say, oh, uh, we have to talk to you about this issue because investors are asking why KBRA didn't rate it. Um, and so we've got to get you to take a look at it. That's really rewarding because that, again, speaks to the trust that investors have placed in uh, KBRA over these many years that we've worked diligently to stay close to them. Yeah, and David, I would I would add, um, at the risk of stating the obvious, that finance is a global business and we've been able to export what we stand for um, to markets around the world. So now you've got, you know, we've been very successfully uh, operating now in the UK and Europe uh, and continue to sort of build uh, our geographic presence around the world. It's it's it follows naturally, but when you do things the right way that investors and issuers respond to, uh, we're welcomed into these markets. And I think that's been also the case. It's been so gratifying to get that endorsement. Uh, after you work hard, you think you build a better mousetrap, the way you do business matters, and uh, it's been been received around the world. That's a great point. And I, I don't want to embellish too much, but uh, I've always viewed the role of rating agencies as almost a public service. Okay, I know there, there are lines of distinction between private and public sector, but at the end of the day, the ability of companies to raise capital, to build a business, expand a business, sustain a business, is only as good as their access to the capital markets. And Ben, you were, you know, Goldman Sachs and, and, and such. Obviously, the, the banks play a critical role, but investors are not going to be able, most, many investors are not going to be able to do their own work. And even if they're doing their own work, there's still a heavy reliance on a trusted intermediary, which right. is the rating agency, because they're the ones who actually can spend the time that you alluded to, Jim. They have the expertise. We'll do our own homework, but the significance of the role, and certainly it was underscored during the, you know, the aftermath of the financial crisis, the significant public service that a trusted agency performs in the marketplace is absolutely critical. And you've alluded to the private credit market. Yeah. At first people were scoffing. It is big business now. It is the new, new thing. Right. Is, everyone is marketing. You know, some kind of platform or some kind of fund right. that's involved with private credit. You know, and it's great that you said that because that is what's so ironic about this. So now is the time that I find we're being, uh, you know, having to uh, think more critically, provide more scrutiny in the market as it grows, as it sort of, you know, gets as the growth really starts to accelerate just at the time that the rate the other rating agencies are coming in now it's not the time for let's you know let's let's look at everything let's do everything now's the time for we we have to be very measured we have to be very thoughtful about what we do this is a great market there are a lot of opportunities but we've really got to think think uh, about what we're doing and that's now the time that they're all coming in so it's really it's going to be very interesting to watch um, the other point I wanted to make, you you said something really interesting uh, about the, the responsibility that rating agencies have. And we take that very seriously, even beyond 
the initial rating. So for instance, we provide in our financial institutions area, the 160 banks that we rate and the BDCs that we rate, we do a quarterly compendium and we provide every quarter a one page update on how that institution is doing. We provide it in a compendium to investors. So not only do, can they rely us rely on us on day one when we rate the institution, but they can rely on us quarterly to not to do their work for them, but to provide them the framework and the information that they need to ask the question so that they don't have to spend their time gathering all that information together, putting it in spreadsheets. We do it for them. That's our responsibility. We are public servants in that respect. And we do have a responsibility to the investment community to make sure that they have that information in a timely manner so that they can do the work they need to be comfortable with their positions. So, uh, Ben, it's, I'll, I'll translate a little bit. The work you do is not just a snapshot in a single moment of time. Uh, there is, I'll, I'll use the term in quotes, but you've incorporated almost a fiduciary role to stay current with the companies that you've rated to give investors as well as issuers an understanding of the the current status, anything that's changed. And I assume you're also looking at macro environments as well, not just simply things that may be happening within the company. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, David. So again, it's our responsibility. Credit is a living, breathing thing, right? That changes. Um, any investor knows that. And so, you know, you can imagine, you know, the alternative might be we do the work. It's based on a backward look. We get the rating done. It's out there in the market. It's not enough, right? Credit moves. Our role in evaluating default risk is to look for material and sustaining changes in default risk. And because the world does move at a micro and a macro level, um, your real value to an investor, to the market, is going to be staying on top of issues, probing managements on what's changed, how they're responding, thinking through their growth strategies. Does it make sense? Thinking through their capital structure choices. Is that appropriate? Is, maybe it was appropriate a few years ago. It might not be appropriate going forward. Investors demand all of that in a real-time basis. And so every analyst at KBRA understands this and uh, and is charged with staying on top of their credits, both at, again, a micro level and even speaking my own role, what's happening on a macro side? How is that changing how we think about unemployment or economic growth or geopolitical risk, right? Those are all things that obviously today are moving around dramatically and keeping on top of that and thinking about it down to the credit level is another essential part of how we go about doing this. Not only, you know, to Jim's point, you know, are we going in and at the, at the, from a bottoms up perspective, doing the work, but also checking against what's happening at a macro level, I think is an absolutely essential part of this responsibility and one that, you know, our our competitors have not always gotten right or valued, uh, I should say, in the past. I want to definitely get into a couple of macro uh, points. And Jim, since I've heard you uh, interviewed I, and uh, my prior conversation with Ben, uh, I threw something out there. He says, oh, Jim will want to talk about that in a moment. Uh, we'll get there. But uh, because we have the, you know, with this uh, conference, we have board members and C-suite representatives. Uh, maybe you can just, you know, take two minutes and explain how you engage with clients and what's required in this process of working with an issuer and arriving at a rating. Um, absolutely, you know. So the 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 Dodd Frank actually uh, helped define the rules much better. Uh, prior to Dodd Frank, there were uh, not as many rules around engagement, around methodologies, and so 
Now, I think Dodd Frank, the the we and we could argue for days, weeks, months about Dodd Frank and 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 the various aspects of it, and some of which I I don't think have served the public well. But the few things that I do think have been have done a good job is around rating agencies and the and the uh, rating process, and that is that the analytic business and the business of of signing engagements and and uh, and uh, business development with issuers is completely separate. So analysts have nothing to do with going out and trying to engage new clients or to bring in new business. Now we we obviously use their work to uh, let clients see this is the kind of work that we do because we want to win the 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 work on on the merits. Uh, but the the separation is pretty stark. It's, you know, you have business development people and then you have. So the business development people start the process. They actually engage with the client and they will, if there are questions, they'll bring the 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 analyst to a meeting and say, here's what we, we can talk about the the analytic side of the business. And then we typically send out to uh, new clients uh, the the methodologies that we would be using for that particular deal, all of which have to be published now. And it has to be very clear about what we do to arrive at the rating using the methodology. Now it includes our judgment, but there are clear sort of, we, we look at, you know, these, uh, this set of data, you need to provide us this amount of, of data, whether it's two years, three years, whatever. Then we sign an engagement letter, and the engagement letter typically talks about the pre-rating, uh, the the pre-engagement. Uh, sorry, the the lead up to the rating, and then post-rating. And so the the uh, the engagements are generally, you know, talk about what the time frame that it takes to get to the the rating. And we we try to be very accommodating to clients. We understand that. Uh, you know, we live in the world and sometimes we don't have three months to, to finish a rating. And so if there's a if there's a bit of a crunch, we try to work with the issuer to make sure we accommodate that. And then once the engagement letter is signed, then the business development people sort of step out of the process. And that's when the analysts take over the relationship with the client. And then it becomes that relationship from from that point on, even post rating when we're doing surveillance work. So when we, you know, talk to a particular client, say on a quarterly basis to get an update on where they are, that all stems from the analytic side of the business. Did I miss anything, Vim? Nope, I think that's that's largely it. I would say that, you know, the information requirements are those that uh, an issuer would typically uh, provide any lender or shareholder. So it tends to be readily available information. We'll have a you know, a due diligence session with senior management to make sure that we understand the story, give them a chance to explain the nuances of their business um, so that we capture it accurately uh, for the market. So it's, a, again, it's a process that uh, I think is that most issuers, potential issuers, uh, have already done a lot of this work for their other stakeholders. Um, and again, we can turn things around uh, fairly quickly once we uh, once we get access to management and all of that information in house. And then you alluded to this uh, historical data does matter. Uh, obviously, the story of the company itself and the history of the company, uh, the backgrounds and history of the management, et cetera, uh, the competitive risks, the macro issues, and, uh, you know, generally speaking, you know, sort of how proceeds are going to be used. And sort of the, what I'll refer to the, uh, a little bit of the timeline of the use of that because money borrowed has to be repaid and, you know, the right. strength of the balance sheet. And uh, Jim, you uh, already sort of alluded to the, one of the differentiators uh, with KBRA, which is the qualitative time that is spent to, with the company and the people and to, you know, actually, the issue is being able to find the analyst or the analyst team uh, to help work on things. 
That's true. And and I, I think the best example I can give you is that we have hired seasoned analysts to lead each of the areas that we that we uh, work in. And I think it's the most apparent when we're talking about hard and fast rules. We try not to have hard and fast rules. We try to be sensible because every every uh, opportunity that's presented to us has a different back pattern. And one of my favorite stories is we had a, a company, an air leasing company, come to us uh, that was n- newly started. It had only been in business for a year and a half. It had three of the most seasoned veterans in the industry that were running this new company. And our competitors had a hard and fast, we don't rate anything until it's been in business three years. We instead of looking at the track record of just that business, we looked at the track record of those individuals and said, you know what? This makes more sense to me than three years of data on a company that just started up with people who don't have this background and who aren't as well seasoned and and don't understand the market as well as these guys do. And so that's been a real differentiator for us is that we We try to think reasonably and practically about the information that we're provided, and we try to come up with a solution that works for the issuer and for the investor. Doesn't always, and there are times when when you know three three people would come to us that don't have that background and say, "Will you look at it?" And we have a startup, and we'll say, "You know, not enough information, and you don't have enough of a background in the industry." to get us comfortable. And so you really do have to wait three years or four years, whatever it is. But where the fact pattern is very different, we just don't use a rule and say, oh, nope, you haven't been in business for three years. We can't look at you. We think logically and think, no, I think investor. And it turned out the the first few issues of that particular company that I'm talking about were oversubscribed immediately because the investors knew that these guys were well seasoned. And what they wanted from us is to make sure that everything they were doing in the company was set up properly and that the company was running properly and that they had a good plan. So it, it you know, I think I think being and, and I think we've learned this with, from talking to investors because that's what investors want. Investors don't want a bunch of rules. They want us to be nimble and be thoughtful. And when we're presented with opportunities, that creates opportunities for investors is when we can look at something a bit differently and say, yeah, there's an opportunity here. We need to work to get to the right rating. And, and, and I, I'm fond of saying our, our job is to get to the right rating, not the lowest rating, the right rating. I could never I could I could tell I could tell you tomorrow I could set up a company and never have to worry about a downgrade. I just rate everything triple C. Wouldn't have to worry about anything. Does that help investors? Absolutely not. So, and it doesn't help investors, obviously, if I give too high of a rating, that certainly doesn't help investors. I give too low of a rating, that doesn't help investors either. And it certainly doesn't help the capital markets. And so our goal has always been to get to the right rating. That's a a great point. And uh, again, at least to me, it underscores I'm, I'm focused on this, Dan. And, you know, when things work properly at Goldman, it was a win-win situation, right? Uh, right. And this is not just about investors and, and they're getting a, the appropriate return on their investment and the investment being secure. Uh, it's, it's also about access to the capital markets because, to use your example, Jim, these people, because of the newness of their, the novelty of their business, they were unable to access the capital markets. How does that serve anyone? Right. Right. And, right. And, and it's it's a great story about thinking outside the box, and I'll call it the triumph of uh, common sense over uh, a rules based um, environment. Uh, let me. I, w- I want to switch now to the macro because so much of what can affect companies it are the macro environments, and if one of the themes of our conference is enterprise resiliency. And, you know, you can know your company inside out, but things can happen on a macro level, geopolitically, financially, reputationally. 
And I'm going to draw on something, uh, Ben, because you you talked about some of the data you were able to build up and, you know, these so-called black swan events, I, I no longer think they're black swans. I think there's, there's you know, a, a block of black swans out right, there right. that are potentially out there. And, um, you know, the people, the, our clients are never going to have heard me speak about this before, but I love to collect uh, the predictions of really, really smart people at the end of every year about what they think is going to occur in the next year. And it's not that these people are not brilliant because they are, and they're great. They're great leaders, whether it's in government or, or in the private sector or academia. And, and they are right about some things, but it is amazing how many things get missed. All right. And, and if there's, I, I, I've described the game of prediction as a fool's errand. Uh, it is very humbling. I don't know why they keep doing it. I guess because right. someone put a microphone in front of them and says, what do you see in your crystal ball? And we're going to be uh, graced with Abby Joseph Cohn at our conference, who is as smart as they come. And I have the benefit of working with her at Goldman and subsequently. And she's ver she's both very humble and, and very insightful. But let me, uh, I, I want to understand how KBRA thinks about the macro issues, how you publish on it or advise on it, maybe that's a better term. And then I'll pull up your example. So nobody, and, and nobody predicted, and yet with hindsight was predictable. The beginning of 2024, we saw the run on some regional banks and mid-level banks. And uh, it happened very, very quickly. Fortunately, you know, we had good leadership, we'll call it both in the public arena and the private arena. And, you know, there wasn't, you know, a, a yet another knock on contagion event. But it was very, very interesting, particularly if you live here in New York and you saw, you know, the run on this bank and then Silicon Valley Bank, uh, et cetera. And yet, in hindsight, very predictable in many respects. And a lot of focus was on what the board should have been thinking about and perhaps what they should have been doing as well as the C-suites. There was a lot of complacency. I'll use the word complacency um, out there. And so as you think about your important role, not only in rating specific issues, but in providing important perspective on the macro environment, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that. And then, Jim, we'll conclude with talking about the balance sheet of the United States. Perfect. <laughs> I okay. think that's the easier of the two. Uh, yes, go ahead, Ben. Why don't you start off? Yeah. But yeah, let's let's talk about. Um, so, you know, one of the things coming through the pandemic that we that we thought, and I think it was really a non-consensus view uh, when we look back, is just how different this time is, right? So, if we think about Sir John Templeton's, you know, famous words, the four most dangerous words, and in finances, this time is different. This time really was different because of the magnitude of stimulus, how it preserved the economy, and then how the unwind was going to be pretty painful. And so as we think through that and where we are now, we think about, and this touches, uh, David, on your on, on the bank issue, but we, we think about how cash flows of our issuers are now tested against not only um, higher interest rates, but slower growth, higher costs related to security of everything, right? So whether it's onshoring, you know, shoring up your supply chains, um, cybersecurity, all of those things are going to be higher costs for, for any issuer out there. We think about technological disruption, right? So every single issuer that we now look at, we've got to ask ourselves, are they on the right side or the wrong side of technological innovation or disruption, right? And if we go back to the banking example, those three banks that failed were highly idiosyncratic, right? They didn't look like the 4,600 banks that are out there. They were really, really different. Um, but what it showed us was, was how banking, retail banking, um, was going to be revolutionized by technology. All of a sudden, holding on to your deposits can be as difficult as somebody swiping on their phone, which I think is what we saw 
in some of those failures. And so as an example, we've got to think through what is the technological disruption coming to this particular industry or this particular um, issuer. I think it's it's super important, especially if you're looking forward, right, which we always want to do. Um, we think there's going to be higher geopolitical risk than we've had in the past, right? So how does that affect your particular um, business? Is it a plus? Is it a minus? All of these things do make the forward look uh, more challenging, I would argue, than than what we've enjoyed, if that's the right word, over the last 15 years. You know, the other thing that, that clearly is worth pointing out here is that we got a lot of investors got used to an ultra low rate environment for a long period of time. And now that's not sustainable. Higher cost of capital has come back uh, into markets, and I'd argue in a, in a very healthy way, it's going to unleash capitalism's creative destruction. That ultimately is a good thing, right? Zombie companies that are preserved aren't good for an economy. And so we've had a big rise of zombie companies across the US and really the world ever since the GFC. And now I think with a higher cost of capital, more difficult to achieve an acceptable rate of return, um, that's going to be a challenge that every single management team that we have a conversation with is going to have to, to answer for. So again, those we really do think the environment is different. We're at a pivotal point, a, really a change uh, in in credits paradigm going forward, and it's kind of a back to the future kind of thing. We this wasn't you know ultra low rates weren't always uh, you know the the way of the world. We just got really used to it, and to use your word, maybe even complacent a bit. Now it's it's back to back to the future. We've we've operated in this environment before. We're going to have higher rates, slower growth. Um, investors are going to apply a more uh, challenging and greater scrutiny to the stories they hear. We can be helpful. We need to be helpful in sorting through a lot of those issues uh, to be a real value to our to our clients. And, and David, you mentioned boards. I would add one other thing. I think that the time now when you think about board meetings, and we, we think about this from our own board meetings, it, it used to be if you went to a board meeting 20 years ago, and I, I remember this when I was at Fitch, you went to a board meeting. The board meetings were very straightforward. They were very set. We talk about this and we talk about this and we talk about this. What I've noticed over time, and I think this is good corporate hygiene and good corporate governance, is that more of the meeting is becoming unstructured. There's more information available now. We have better tools to provide that information. And so leaving time to allow board members to question and to have discussions that go far beyond where the, the current uh, landscape is, but to ask those questions that could uncover a weakness in, in your capabilities, a weakness in your system. But I just think that that one of the things that we're going to be seeing more of, and I think it's really a good thing is this idea that less of the board meeting is structured. And, and I can tell you as a CEO, that's a frightening thing because, because those board, board meetings can go sideways quickly. Uh, but from a corporate hygiene standpoint, it is such a great thing for a corporation to be able to have those free-flowing discussions to talk about things like AI, cyber risk, and 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 go beyond just the sort of current platitudes and the current sort of thinking. Ask the hard question, questions. Ask the the tough. Have we done this? Have we done that? And I think that corporations in the long run are going to be better off for that type of uh, that shift in the way board meetings are conducted. That's great. And both of you have alluded to the lessons learned from prior crises. Also, if something bad happens to one company in your industry, understanding how that happened and could it happen to you. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, uh, just a, a quick note, Ben, uh, you refer to the uh, ability to swipe your assets from one institution to another. Uh, what we were very, very focused on, and I, I in particular, was what when a run occurs these days because of social media, there is an acceleration 
And I still remember since you alluded to John Templeton back in 86, I think it was when the market went down about 20 percent. And I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I actually had a jury out uh, and the judge was going to declare a mistrial because he thought it would be too distracting. Uh, I was watching. I'm, I'm going to date myself here, Jim. But, you know, there wasn't you know really an Internet or anything. But I stayed up to 2 a.m. Uh, on CNN and Sir John Templeton came on just a photograph and he was explaining what was going to happen. He was very calm about it. And, but ultimately he made a ridiculous prediction about where the Dow was going to be in a year or two years, et cetera, but said this, these are the normal things. About it. I was finally able to go to sleep. But what I will tell you in this environment of social media, you know, a lot of what happened at uh, SVB, a lot of what happened at First Republic, Social media played a big role. And so as we think about enterprise resiliency, we'll be addressing this as well at the conference. The role of KBRA to basically speak about the lessons learned and to speak about, I'll call them the macro or exogenous factors that can sneak up is, is absolutely critical. All right, Jim, uh, didn't reserve enough time, but I'm, I'm going to start the conversation here. A lot has been focused on the U.S. balance sheet and our debt and our rising debt. It's something um, that I have been reading about now for decades. Uh, and there's some wonderful, as you know, think tanks that are focused on it. So a lot of former politicians, you know, beat the drum. Uh, but KBRA, you know, just, you know, looking at it as a rating and, you know, there's been controversy when the U.S. debt was downgraded or some other sovereign debt was, you know, downgraded. Just how should, uh, I think there's some lessons, first of all, for the board members and C-suites of companies uh, in terms of what's happening politically, but maybe you can apply your lens to this, both you and Van, and give us some viewpoints. Sure. I, I feel very strongly about this, and I'll be, I'll be quick because I, I think it's not a, a, a long or, or nor is it a complicated conversation. The uh, what we need to do and what I think KBRA has done a great job of doing is separate the uh, the impact that the U.S. rating has on domestic policies, on the domestic markets, on monetary policy, on fiscal policy. That's all important. And I understand that. But that is that is within the United States. And that is, those are in many ways political conversations and they need to be had and they need, and they're important and we need to have. Them. And, and I think that, that, that goes without saying. Confusing that and, and bringing that into the realm of how we look at the rating of the United States is is i think uh, is is not great for the the ratings in general not great for the market and it certainly sends conflicting messages about the entire rating system so if you have a rating system it has to be anchored to something so there has to be a triple a or whatever your highest rating is that is the 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 anchor for all of the ratings and that is usually what we consider the risk-free rating and that implies that it has to be a rating that can issue debt regardless of its balance sheet that can issue debt in up and down cycles because it's the reserve currency of the world and those those local domestic political issues are separate from the fact that it is the reserve currency of the world and the fact that the U.S. can basically issue debt regardless of how much debt's outstanding, regardless of what their balance sheet looks like. That is that is the, the AAA. That is the, the rating that all other ratings are anchored to. And why S&P's nonsensical downgrade is so disruptive, I think, to the market is a couple of things. So what you end up with, you end up with this, this, and I'll just give you one example that I think is probably the silliest. And that is that, so there are a thousand subprime borrowers that collectively have a better rating than the United States government. 
In what world does that make sense? And S and P rates subprime issues triple A, the top, the the highest category. They rate residential mortgage deals triple A. They rate commercial mortgage deals triple A. And yet they have the government in the double A category. Makes no sense. Does it internally how they do that? I, I don't understand. The second thing I will give you that I think is even more important to the argument is what happened when S and P downgraded the <laughs> the, the, the U.S. government. Treasuries rallied. The world bought treasuries. They saw instability. And what do they do when they see instability? They buy treasuries. So the point at which I will become worried about the, the U.S. rating and start to think about what we need, how we need to think about our anchor for our rating system is when the U.S. dollar is no longer the the uh, reserve currency of the world, and where the U.S. there are constraints around what they can issue relative to their balance sheet. That's the point that I that we as analysts will start to say, oh, okay, we really do have to rethink what the anchor to our rating scale is. Beyond that, these these arguments are nonsensical, and the, and and you read these reports and they say, oh, we're thinking about putting the U.S. on watch because, you know, this nonsense down in Washington, they're arguing over whether they're going to raise the debt ceiling or not. That has no bearing on whether or not the U.S. government is AAA. What has bearing on whether the U.S. government is AAA is their standing in the world, their standing as a leader in the world, and the fact that every investor in a crisis wants to own U.S. treasuries. That tells you all you need to know. Great points, um, fellow primacy. And I'll just uh, mention something Ben and I had a chance to speak about before, but obviously the fact that the US is a beacon, I'll use that word, for political stability, notwithstanding the political dialogue, rule of law. <laughs> we'll get through it, yeah. But your, your point and, is absolutely correct. Yeah. So uh, I, we'll, we'll, I hate to say this, but it's not a time to worry yet. How's that? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, I want to thank both of you uh, for a wonderful, thoughtful conversation. Uh, more to be done. I'm going to impose upon you. We're going to do some follow-up after the conference. Uh, we'd love to continue the dialogue. And really, one of the toughest things to do in the world, and I can speak because of the business I was able to start at Gold, Goldman Sachs that, you know, 20 of the leading banks and Bain Venture jumped on and, but I had, you know, Goldman there. But to start a business, to actually recognize a void in the market and have an idea, uh, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll bore you with this, I have sort of like the, the four W's that I impose upon myself and, and people who come to us who want to do something. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why now and with whom? And I will tell you, we, we, you're not a you're not a box checking company, guys. But you check all the boxes. You filled an important void. You did it at the right time. You did it with the right people, as you've alluded to, with seasoned analysts, and um, you know for the right reasons. So you, in 15 years, incredible success. It's not easy, uh, as both of you know. But I want to. Uh, commend you, but also I want to thank you for a terrific conversation, and I look forward to continuing it. So, thank you, guys. David, thank you. This has been terrific. We've really enjoyed it. This is a great opportunity for us. Thank you, David, and thank you, Jim. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Thanks for listening to this special edition episode of the Rain Insights series from Rain Network. For more content from the Rain and NASDAQ Summit, please visit the link in the description.